Right. All right, welcome to chemistry. I am your teacher, Dr. Joyce Sherpa. For those of you viewing this before you've met me, um, I'm really excited. Many of you have been actually on my YouTube channel already, which is amazing, and I haven't even had a class with you yet. So that's what I look like, safe with goggles. And right. so, right, the very first lecture, I always start out by saying, you know, what did you think you're going to be doing in chemistry? When you hear the word chemistry, and I get usually one of two answers. One is, oh, we're gonna have explosions, reactions and stuff. And I owe an apology. Uh, I usually do a really cool demo the first day and I have to go to school to videotape it. And I have to go through um, a lot of red tape to be able to go to school. And so I did, uh, and I was there and I was getting ready to set it up. Uh, and somebody came and talked to me and then somebody else came in to do their stuff in the lab and I'm that type of person who stepped aside. Um, so it's still waiting. You'll get to see it um, when I do go in because I have some other stuff to videotape. So you'll just have to be patient. Um, and so this slide is plagiarized and that actually does look like me. Um, the other thing I get chemistry is math. I always have a student say, it's a lot of math. Uh, and I'll ask the question, which of you have had chemistry before? Which of you are excited to be here? And it's always a perfect correlation. The students excited to be in the chemistry class have never had chemistry before. So they're a clean slate. Um, and some of you are not clean slates. And so I would ask you to be, um, and to give me a chance, <laughs> please, <laughs> more than one class. Um, Chemistry is math. Uh, we will be doing some of the sacred geometry, beautiful figures and stuff, and it is chemical reactions, but we're gonna have to start with the basics. Uh, this is an introductory chemistry class, whether you're in my Chem 104 or 151. Yes, again, I'm double dipping. And this is a picture of me again, uh, in case you couldn't see me with the goggles. Um, and I do, I look like that, um, the mad scientist there. All right, move on. So what is chemistry? This is a definition. You don't need to write anything down from this video. Again, you just watch it. And then after it's part of your first lab, you just write a paragraph or two of your thoughts, something that inspired you or made you think. Um, so chemistry is a study of matter. What is matter? What's the matter? Matter is the physical substance. So it's the study of matter, the composition, the structure, the properties, and the transformation. This is a transformative class. If you think of it that way, just like the little caterpillar goes through the transformation, becoming the butterfly. Yeah, it's there twice, twice in the definition. The word transformation, different way to view it. And it is, when I think of chemistry, this is what I think of. Um, it's really hard for me to be limited to the screen because I'm so expressive. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, the periodic table, that is Mendeleev, and I'll talk about him in a little bit. And yeah, all right. So we're gonna do a quick tour, well, a brief tour of atomic theory, a quest for the building blocks of matter. And I'll point out things you need, um, but we'll be lecturing on this and so you'll get it. This is just to whet your appetite and go, chemistry is awesome. I'm so excited to come to my chemistry class each week. Um, so it was, right? We're looking for those building blocks. What are we made of? Uh, and it's pretty much kind of like that Lego guy. That's what I feel like at times. So in the beginning, so one of the stories we're told is there was a big bang and even Professor Hawkins says, well, it's just an idea. That's not how we're presented. Uh, all this is ideas. There's always a piece that's missing. They even say, because they can't say where that first bang came from. Uh, and there are, they're, they're studying, they, there's this one, talk I heard, I, I find some of these talks really arrogant because they'll say there's only three mysteries left to solve in science. And one of them is consciousness. It's very interesting. And yes, I said, they call it the C word. 
um, to be able to talk about consciousness in a science class. All right, so in the beginning, we said everything, the gods determined everything, right? Atlas is holding up the planet, and the sun is brought across the sky by the chariot, the golden chariot every day, and Thor creates thunder, and then the ancient Ionian philosophers around 600 BC, and yes, that word ion is there. That's where the word ion comes from. Uh, so they took the will of the gods, the mythological disorder, and they began asking, what is nature made of? They tried to make laws, law and order out of the universe. They wanted to understand what is nature made of. They started using observation to explain the natural world. Now, this is not the only place this was going on. There are places before this, looking at it from a different viewpoint, um, especially like ancient India. But we're gonna look at it from this viewpoint, that there were several people who said the elements were made up of, uh, there was one guy who said air, we were only made up of air. But this guy, Epidocles, came up with the four element theory. He was not the first to come up with an element theory. Again, in ancient Sanskrit, uh, they have the elements, but his were uh, earth, water, air, and fire. And he also thought he was a god, and to prove it, he walked into Mount Etna. I don't recommend doing that because he um, was no longer with us in his human flesh. Uh, but there you go. This is his thoughts in ancient Greek. Uh, this is the what I mentioned, the Ayurvedic or ancient India. So you can see they have earth, water, fire, air, uh, and then ether. Actually, there's a fifth one, um, and ether is the transformative. So it is what we now talk about as the quantum, the vibrations. Um, it was the God um, essence or the angelic essence, however you want to think about. This is the five element theory in Chinese medicine. I also have a degree in Chinese medicine, uh, which is a fascinating one because they don't have air. It's the only one I've ever seen that doesn't have air. And they actually have three that they have wood and earth um, and metal. Uh, all right, and then this is um, Aristotle endorsed Epidocles and did his four elements, but he brought in the ether elements. And he also brought in the sacred geometric shapes for each one of these, uh, which fascinates me. Oh, and then of course there's the Lego movie, which is an awesome movie. And they also had green. Green was one of the elements and its superpower was being green. Um, it's maybe like the wood element in Chinese medicine. And you know what? There was something missing from that. Something I was gonna mention um, that should have happened here is this tetrahedron we're going to become very familiar with it. It's one of Aristotle's sacred geometries. Uh, also the dodecahedron, the octahedron. These are all different shapes in chemistry. Um, and of course the center one, uh, we run into several of these. All right, so there's the fairies. There's the fairies had, you can play this game apparently. This was the original game. Uh, there's books written out, um, the elementals. You may or may not have heard of the elementals. And earth is the gnomes. And this is, this is ancient. This is where the gnomes come from. Uh, the fairies are the air. Uh, I forget what the salamander guy's called. He has a fancy name. And then the mermaids were water. So when you get me going into my fantasy world and your story problems, is it really? It is chemistry based back to the elements. Um, and so there's all these different images and all these different people, including the ducks, which is unfortunate because the fire element is the transformative and then back to the ancient Sanskrit. So for those of you um, into yoga, the chakras actually all follow these. Um, also, which was there before the, the element theory of Aristotle uh, and probably um, teachers had traveled and they got bits and pieces because it was a verbal tradition. Um, now, in a similar time is these two, and I am not going to say the names correctly, Lucipus and Democritus. 
uh, Democrates. So uh, the first gentleman is the teacher. This is a Dutch painting from like a couple hundred years ago because there's no photos obviously of them or paintings or anything. Um, and they are credited, the, the teacher Lucipus is credited with the idea of atoms, that matter consists of an infinity of small, imperishable, indivisible particles. In fact, the word atom in Greek means indivisible, that it cannot be split. These atoms are constantly in motion and through their collisions gather together into a whirl to form the cosmos. Democrates was the student, he was known as the laughing philosopher, and he took this a step further and he said, what if, what if you took a piece of gold or a piece of feta cheese or a potato and you cut it in half so the gold would make more and you keep cutting and cutting and cutting, you still have gold, he said you get to a point where you can no longer cut it and that's what the little atoms are over there and so you can think of it like a walk on the beach. You and I are made up of the atoms. And so when we look at the beach, it just looks like a giant expanse. That's Joey and Shanti is a puppy. Shanti is a forever puppy because she's still that size. She never grew. Um, so from a distance, it looks like one smooth blanket. Like you and I, we look like one being, right? Uh, and as you approach, you start to notice the peaks, the mounds, but it's still one solid continuous expanse. And then as you get closer, you can see the particles of sand. Yes, they fell down and fell asleep. Uh, and so then you arrive to the beach, you kneel down, you build your sand castle, and those grains of sand would be like the atoms that you and I are made up of, or pixels. Uh, the more pixels you have, the better the resolution, and so atoms are infinite pixels um, or Legos like in the original picture. So the sand, the grains of sand, individual sand would like individual atoms. Um, so it's a quote from Democrates, nothing is except atoms. His atoms all had different like qualities. So water was a could flow past itself because of how the atoms were and iron had little sticky things on it. Things that were bitter had like barbs on it that would barb your tongue and catch it. Uh, and then you have these cartoons. These two are in debate. Aristotle's the one you all know of because he won. Uh, Democrates again um, apparently was always jolly and happy, had a lot of anandamide. Uh, and yeah, Aristotle said no, things flow because we all followed this for thousands of years. And interestingly, it may be going back to this. So it was successful. Any thoughts why it was successful? Uh, by the way, that used to be at least available on naturescandydesigns.com. I don't know if it's dark chocolate, but you know, the teacher's birthday's coming up. All right, oh, there's the picture. Oh, there's the picture again. So, um, there's the tetrahedron, there's the octahedron, there's buckyball, so they all come together and the reason he's successful, sorry, um, this was just another one that shows they each have an alchemical symbol is what those are um, and they each have a direction, a time of day and all these things. The reason this theory was so successful and is still successful and will be is it is solid earth it is a liquid water and it is air it is the states of matter solid liquid gas and fire is the transformative heat so if you take any substance remember transformation the study of chemistry is the study of transformation it's really we're in a yogic science class so cool just wait till we get to quantum mechanics so who are the original chemists? I could go on about the elements for hours and hours, and I already probably have. Uh, well, it's the gnomes. I already told you that. They're associated the elemental of Earth. Uh, the alchemist, this Paracelsus, brought back the idea of gnomes. He said, so fish go through the water and birds go through the air. What goes through the Earth? And he said, well, it must be the gnomes. Um, and so he brought back 
made this a popular idea. And he was always run out of town by the scientists, but all the common people loved him. Uh, if you go back even further, the ancient Egyptians, they were doing so much chemistry. Their embalming is freaking amazing. And then of course perfumes, because you can take baths every day. Uh, and their makeup, that black, their black eyes was antimony or antimony, which is SB. So on your periodic tables, this is usually when I point to the big periodic table in the class. Um, we'll talk about the periodic table in one of our first lessons. But element number 51 is SB, stibnium, uh, which is antimony. And that's what the black was. Uh, there was metallurgy, all the metal ages, the copper age, the bronze age, right? They started figuring out how to do all that. That's chemistry. And then of course, making soap and all the herbs. So in ancient China, that's the whole Chinese medicine thing that is so successful, um, is they were looking for the elixir of life for whatever the emperor, I think is what they were called. Um, or if any of these cultures looking at that in, in our spices and stuff. All right, um, and also baking, cooking, brewing, every culture, the one at the bottom is uh, the Tibetans. So the Sherpas are, uh, came from Tibet. The word Sherpa means Easterner. So they migrated from Eastern Tibet following their yaks, ended up in Nepal for 700 years before anybody knew they were there because the valley is so remote. And that's where Pimba is right now. It's chilly sad. Um, it has been for the whole Corona thing because he can't get out of there. He's so lucky. Kind of wish we were with him. Um, so maybe another time. All right, uh, so chemistry is like cooking. Just don't lick the spoon. Remember that because you're going to get to do a couple of kitchen chemistry experiments um, since lab is a component of this class. Uh, your first lab has a couple, some of the labs are paper labs and some of them you'll do stuff in the kitchen and write notes down. And then of course there's the alchemists and notice the gnomes. You guys see the gnomes? And the black cat and more gnomes. Uh, and so the alchemist and there is something about the Harry Potter, right? All these guys, actually the Franciscan monks, right? A lot of the monks were actually did a lot of chemistry. Um, there was not the separation of church and science yet. It was actually, the church was doing a lot of the science. Newton, most of his writings are actually theological. And the next number one thing, number two is actually the alchemical writings. Uh, and then all of his physical laws and stuff, which he is known for. Um, and of course there's games and there's Gandalf, the magicians, they're all doing chemistry. It's all chemistry. And this is the alchemical periodic table. It's got phlegm in there and liquor hepatitis and all these fascinating things. And coagulation is so when I tell you guys, learn your periodic table, obviously you're going to have it because you're at home. You're going to want to have one by you, but you want to learn the names of those first 36 elements. You want to, so you're just know them. Uh, it's chemistry. So when you see carbon in another class, you know C is carbon and CA is calcium. And if you don't mix it up, you're a smarty pants. All right, and here you go. You can stop this and, and take a picture of it. And I offer this as extra credit. You mix the yolks of eggs, some sawdust fire, some green substance, some water, and then you have to find divine water. But um, it's probably up in the gorge somewhere in those waterfalls. And don't touch it with your hands. And then you need the shell and the sun. We have the sun and water and you get gold and yeah. Okay, if you want to try and make it, just got to document it. We should see that as a lab. Oh, and then the dark ages came. And science and religion got separated and science got squelched and did not happen. In the Arab world, there was a gentleman named El Jabir. Uh, and yes, he is credited with algebra. That's where it comes from. So he uh, documented, was writing down, was really important about writing stuff down. Um, and also a lot of interaction with Asia and stuff and these chemical processes and also in the um, monasteries they were documenting and keeping things backed up as books were being burned all over the place. Um, so the monks actually copied the manuscript because they said the natural laws set into motion by God 
do not change. And so um, this is actually where the word gibberish comes from. So Algebra wrote his notes in code, just like Da Vinci did. Uh, da Vinci wrote everything in code and the monks could not, the in England, could not decode it. Um, and so they called it gibberish. He's writing in gibberish. So not only is it in Arabic, but he wrote it in a code. Um, and then we skip ahead and we get Robert Boyle, who's considered one of the more modern fathers of chemistry. And he said it's important to document your experiments. And that's why we keep a lab notebook and keep data and stuff. And um, Antoine Lavoisier, yeah, you can pick one of, yeah. He, um, do you flog a stated ear? Conservation of mass, mass is not created nor destroyed. Of course, Einstein showed that mass, matter, is just a form of energy. That's a whole quantum thing that we're gonna get into. Uh, the thing that's fascinating about Antoine, one, his head was cut off because he was a tax collector and this is when the French Revolution happens and they say it was one of the most, like, he was brilliant. His wife, very young, she, the men did not let women in the lab. Men and women did not interact, so it was all a male field. She was allowed in the lab because she was married to him, and she documented, and she spoke several languages and was able to communicate. So we started having communication. So she spoke both French and English and another language. Um, anyway, Antoine actually came up with a systematic way of naming stuff, so we can get into nomenclature. Yeah, it sounds like gnome should be spelled with a G. Your teacher will spell it with a G. All right, John Dalton. Um, then we move along. I skip a lot of people here, but he has this idea. He brings back the idea from Democrates and said, hey, you know what? We are. We now have enough evidence from the conservation of mass, conservation of like fixed proportions and all these things and says, let's start talking about atoms again. And he brings back the term atoms. Um, and these were his symbols. So again, be grateful. We just have to learn one um, letter. H is hydrogen or two letters. CA is calcium. He had these wonky symbols because uh, they didn't have the idea yet that there were going to be so many elements. But if we keep looking, we're going to keep finding them. And this is Richard Feynman, who won a Nobel Prize, said this is one of the most important statements. Um, again, you know, one of those arrogant things you get to say when you win a Nobel Prize. There's a statue of John Dalton in Manchester, England, if you ever go there. But he did say all things are made of atoms. You don't need to know the steps of these theories, but he did bring back this term, atoms are small, indivisible particles. We were now ready to say, okay, that is what it is. And everybody suddenly accepted it. By the way, Galileo also believed in atoms, that we were made up of atoms. And so did Newton but we weren't ready to embrace it. And Galileo is under house arrest, so um, it's one step at a time. Elements are made up of only one type of atom. It's characteristic. So carbon is carbon. We're going to see why in a lecture. And oxygen is oxygen. What makes carbon carbon and oxygen oxygen? Um, he didn't know yet about subatomics. And that atoms combine in simple fixed ratios. He did not come up, he came up with one of these laws and I always forget which one. And Joseph Proust came up with the other law. So laws are wonderful. Scientists, especially physicists, they get to make laws. And we say, these are the laws until somebody finds otherwise. Um, so I used to believe when I was a student, this is a law, this is how it is. But it's our understanding of stuff until we get more information as uh, things are accelerating quite fast these days, right? Um, and then atoms cannot be transformed. He did not like alchemists because alchemists were trying to transform lead into gold and the elixir of life. And he didn't like that idea. So he said atoms are fixed. They can't be transformed. You can't change lead into gold. He's actually not right on that. He is correct if it is a chemical reaction, which we would do in our kitchen. Uh, we're going to do nuclear chemistry. For those of you in Chem 104 and Chem 222, I do nuclear chemistry. Um, and we actually, when you get into the subatomic level, you can change one atom into another. Um, all right, just another quote and another beautiful picture of him. All right, that we have these ultimate particles. 
Avogado. We're going to get to know him. We're going to learn about him and the moles. He did not term the term moles. He did come up with the idea of molecules and um, that equal volumes of gas have equal number of molecules. He was laughed at, even though he's a count and had a lot of money. And in 1905, it was actually Albert Einstein. He had four very famous papers and in 1905, one of them was about Brownian motion and molecules. People were ready for molecules to accept molecules. And this dude, he has a Lego after him. I think that's actually Dumbledore. But he, Mendeleev, was playing a game of cards. He was really into cards. They have a number of elements at this point. And the idea of cards can be hearts and spades and clubs and diamonds. And he said, what if, the story is he fell asleep and had an image. Who knows? I love the myths. Um, and so he said, what if the elements are organized into families like hearts and diamonds? And he organized them based on how they reacted with other elements. He was not the only one to do this. There was a lot of people in different parts of the world trying to organize things. Uh, his just, he had a good publisher. He had a great beard. Apparently he only got a haircut once a year. And this is what his table looked like. Um, the thing that's really interesting, if you look at group one, uh, so lithium, sodium, potassium are there in the correct order. They had an idea of basic masses, um, but he also put copper, silver, and gold. And that is because they always reacted in a one-to-one -one ratio with his group seven, which is fluorine and chlorine and bromine. I don't know why he has manganese over there. Well, I kind of do. Um, there are no noble gases yet because they had not discovered them yet. They didn't have these, everything in nature reacts. All the other elements react in the first moment they're created to gain and lose electrons, but they don't know electrons yet. Anyway, here's his table. Um, what I was trying to find is iodine. If you look at group seven over towards the right side, uh, and if you go to the bottom of group seven, there's a J. We now change that to an I, but I guess something to do with the Russian language. And so when I give you the challenge to try to write your name with the periodic table, for those of you with a name like mine, Joyce, you can do it because iodine's original symbol was a J. Kind of cool. Um, the thing that was brilliant about his table was uh, gallium number 31 had not been discovered yet and he left a space for it. So if you look in group three, the green family, boron, aluminum, and then he left a blank because he knew there had to be something there. He didn't just shove titanium in that column. It was based on chemical reactivity, and we'll go through that, and we'll take notes on that. Um, that was something the others didn't do, and then he said he even predicted what the mass would be, um, and he didn't get it quite right, but he, oh, that must be scandium and gallium are the two there. So 44 and 68 are the masses of scandium and gallium that he had in group three, uh, and he left a space for them, uh, and then he ended up being correct. He predicted densities also of these elements, and because there is a trend. And so now we have this table um, that, this one's fun, it's a fun table because it shows a use for each of them. Um, and then we run into Max Planck from Germany. He should be umlauts over there. Uh, and he is the father of the matrix of the quantum. I'm pretty sure he coins the term quantum. That all matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force. This is where the force in Star Wars comes from, folks. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. So welcome to the matrix. It does matter. He's saying there is no matter. There is only a force that creates the matter. Your thoughts, your vibrations, your words. Choose your words carefully, especially in emails. X-rays and radioactivity comes along. That's Curie's over on the left and Rotengen uh, with x-rays. And this enables us to then move into the subatomic world. 
first subatomic particle that is theorized is J.J. Thompson. Again, there were others, but he made the correct conclusion um, that there was something in every element that was smaller than the smallest element, which was hydrogen and still is hydrogen. Um, and that was the electron. He called it an electron, that stands, that's a word for amber in Greek. So if you take a piece of amber, which is um, like a glass rod, and you rub it with wool, you do this with a balloon on your hair, create static electricity, and that's that static is electrons, what he was calling it. Now, the thing that's interesting, and I'll talk about this in the lecture, is um, he thought that atoms were like plum pudding. He was English, he loved his plum pudding. And so he thought it was this pudding, you all know what pudding is, like chocolate pudding or vanilla pudding, and it is pudding. And you have these islands of positivity. I, yeah, and things are floating around. Who knows, could be. And then this gentleman came from New Zealand, wanted to work with J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson, when he first came out with the idea of the electron, everybody was rubbish. And Rutherford was like, read about him, went, whoa, I want to go work with that guy. And then within three years, everybody said, oh my gosh, Thompson's brilliant. They gave him a Nobel Prize. And Rutherford came to work with him uh, and studied nuclear uh, alpha and beta particles, wins the Nobel Prize, gets the Nobel Prize committee mad, but doesn't care, he keeps working. Um, and he does this experiment, the gold foil experiment. This is an important experiment. There's a question in your lab about this. He took his alpha particles, which have a mass of four in the atomic mass. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and he shot them at a piece of gold, and they have a charge of plus two, and he shot it at the gold, and he thought it would um, disperse in different ways, so if we have a plum pudding, we're going to go back. The plum pudding, if you're shooting positive alpha particles, have a plus two. If you're shooting them at this with the plus, the plus spheres, these things should be ricocheting all over the place, but Rutherford didn't find that in his experiment. What he found was 99, oh, I'm sorry, 99.99999, you'll see me do this in lecture, percent, almost all of the particles went straight through. It was one in a million that ricocheted. Why? He said it was like holding a piece of toilet paper up and shooting a gun and the bullet ricochets off. All right, the chance of that happening, don't do this at home. Um, pretty much it always goes through and he could not figure it out. He went with his slide rule, locked himself in a room, did the math based on the angles, how often you saw an angle. And it was this gentleman, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, Nels Bohr, who said, and the reason was, um, what Rutherford determined from his experiment is that the mass of the atom is concentrated, so concentrated, it's the size of a pea or this, you know, chickpea or a, a gummy bear, and you put it in the middle of a football field. The football field, the whole stadium, is the atom and the gummy bear is all the mass. You keep shrinking the gummy bear down because it keeps getting smaller, the nucleus, uh, and all the rest is just emptiness, but it's not really emptiness. The problem, what's happening in that empty space, and we'll talk about it, is the electrons are going around, and um, Rutherford had trouble with this. Nels Bohr came along and said, electrons can only exist at specific places. It's like the planets, circling our sun can only be at certain places once it's established. Um, the words of Albert Einstein, reality is merely an illusion. So that is Nels Bohr with Einstein. Uh, the two of them were great friends and they had many discussions and quantum mechanics is all probability and we will get into that. Um, so we'll get into the subatomics. 
So some of you in Chem 104, we've already talked about this, protons, neutrons, electrons, there's many more. Uh, so the protons and neutrons are scrunched into a gummy bear in the center, and the electrons are on the outside. And there we go, that's Bohr's model. It is, it works to explain all the math. Oh my goodness, we'll talk about this in class, but look at the size of these. So a gram is like a grain of salt. This is 10 to the negative 24th power. This is why we use scientific notation in science. So we give them a relative math, uh, relative mass. AMU is an atomic mass unit. We just say the proton and neutron are roughly one. And the electron is roughly, well, it's not actually zero. It's like, a mouse compared to an elephant. So the protons and neutrons are elephants and the electrons are little mouse running around, running around, running around, running around, or moving in waves really. So that's why I have the elephant and the mouse. So what you need to know are the charges and we'll go through this in lecture. You don't have to write anything down and the masses, the relative masses. So we have this and then they have the quarks and then they have the dark energy and the neutrino and the strong force and the weak nuclear force and Oh my goodness, what does it all mean? Well, let's take a moment. How fast is an electron? It's faster than an ostrich. It's faster than the cheetah. It's faster than the speed of sound. And it is faster than a rocket escaping the Earth's atmosphere. It is moving that many kilometers per second. The sound was half that per hour. Yeah, it's moving really fast. So in miles per hour, it's the distance to the moon. 18 seconds to circle the Earth is the moon. So this is doing that all in one second or something like that. This is an image, that image in the middle up there is all that empty space, that's where everything's happening. That is where potential is happening, that's where the vibrations are happening. We're gonna study matter but it's all about the empty space, which is where the vibes are. Well, let's talk about this. How small is an atom? How many carbon atoms span a single strand of a spider's web? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's 7,000. I was gonna be wrong. D, 7,000 span. Yeah, it's the size micrometer. We're gonna talk about metric. A carbon atom is an angstrom. It's the A. And so that's where the math comes from. This is a spider, right now it's spider web season, right? Um, the width of a spider web, 7,000 carbon atoms. Next time you see a spider web before you go, ew, gross, stop and go, whoa, there's 7,000 atoms. Not the length, the width. Crazy. Tablespoon of water. You guys, most of you, my hand's pretty small. Um, tablespoon of water will fit, the amount of water it fits in your hand if you have your hand cupped. That is, if you had two trillion galaxies of stars, that's how many molecules of water you have. You have that many molecules of water. This is Avogadro's number, we'll worry about it in a couple weeks, but that many galaxies, two trillion galaxies of stars is how many stars you would need to add up to that number, which is the number of molecules that you can hold in the palm of your hand. Whoa, chemistry deals with really small and huge numbers. That's why we're going to learn scientific notation. Yeah, so I hope you have a wow moment. I always talk about, because the planetarium is right next to our classroom, that when students are taking an astronomy class, they're so excited. They're like, I'm taking astronomy. Look what I learned in astronomy. Oh, we're going into the world inside us, which is just as amazing. And I'm not talking about our liver and our heart because everybody's so excited to take anatomy and biology. We're going deeper. We're going down to the atom. So yeah, my family's from Pittsburgh. So you can all be like, oh my God, I can't take class from her. She's a Steelers fan. First Super Bowl I saw was Lynn Swan catching a touchdown. I'm not sure if any of you were alive yet. Um, this is the gummy bear. This is the giant gummy bear. Keeps getting smaller. That is all of your mass is in the gummy bear. And this is all empty space of electrons. All right, that much empty space, just empty. Is it? 
got to clean up a little bit. This is an image of what is going on. There's a lot going on. It's really hard to show an image of what's going on. So, empty space. That's what Rutherford said. That matter is mostly empty space. And then you have this concentrated nucleus. The mass is concentrated in what he called the nucleus, the center. Look at all these notes in class. So the quantum atom is pulsing energy of filled of potential, belief, intention. What's your intention? So what if consciousness is central to transforming the unconstructed quantum world of possibility? So basically your consciousness determines what's possible. So you should be thinking, I am going to rock this class. I'm going to get 100%. I am going to work and learn about this. This is so cool. This is Lynn McTaggart, The Intention Experiment. I have not read the book. But it's on my reading list. Um, and right, it has to do with these particles of love. So some, oh, look at that. I finally got my laser. So what do you need to know? There's always some egg on. What, what from that did I need to know? She just went on and on, and I've been on my phone texting and doing other stuff, and what do I need to know? Um, you can listen to the periodic table song. I think I opened that, offered that as a bonus. Uh, we're not going to listen to it together. You can do that on your own. Um, I will mention, what I will, as we're going through the notes, when we do our homework, that's what you need to know. You need to know our subatomic. What you need to know is hopefully something in here made you go, huh, we're mostly empty space or, whoa, the elementals, gnomes. I'm going to go get a gnome. They're really cool. I think I'll have some chocolate. All right. That we are made up of protons, neutrons, electrons, possibly croutons. I don't know. And we'll talk about how many protons are in sodium. All right. I think. Oh, that's it. All right. So I did a little splice because I couldn't figure out how to stop the song. So forget the calories. Let's talk about vibrations of food. Calories is actually a chemistry term. It's a chemistry and physics term. It's a measurement of heat. And nutritionists took it and started using it for food because food, metabolism and stuff. But it's not actually a number of calories. My other one about your healthy change you're all going to make for the month, I'm real, the month of October. So yeah, start hopefully by the weekend, ideally Thursday. I'm really excited. It's main Chem 151. No way in Chem 151 has ever done it. So the challenge is on for those of you in 151. Anyway, it's all about the vibes. Atoms, matter is all about our vibrations. So this is actually a healing Chinese Qigong um, form that I taught myself during, I learned, and then I retaught myself during uh, spring term. And I do it every morning watching Venus and Mars, and they're about in opposition, which is really cool for those who are into astronomy, acupuncture, I have a degree in that, and it's all about the vibrations. You don't actually need the needles. Pretty sure needles are a placebo. I have a degree in acupuncture. I've done a lot of thought about this. This is the whole thing of the chakras and balancing it. It's all about vibrations, and the vibrations, right? This is um, the gentleman uh, from Japan, who took water crystals and he would expose them to different types of music. And when it was heavy metal, the water crystals couldn't form crystals. If he said negative words like fear, he got these erratic crystals. But if he even, if he said the word love in any language, and even if they, um, if they taped the word love, they got these beautiful crystals. They took the dirtiest water and they had monks chant over it and it turned out beautiful crystals. Pretty cool. I talked about that one year and somebody um, actually had the book and brought it in and showed me. So this is a question. I'll be asking this again at the end of the term. Are you comfortable with discrete particles? That's what we'll be talking about to explain your existence. You're made up of atoms and molecules and ions. Oh my! Electrons orbiting outrageously dense nuclei to form your atoms. We're all going to accept that atomic theory. How comfortable are you with intangible waves, quantum entanglement, string theory, infinite potential, electromagnetic signaling, consciousness, energy, vibrational healing, miracles? Because that's 
It determines the stuff at the top, which is what we talk about this term. It's all about the vibes. The thing that's really cool, your strongest magnetic field is your heart. And the Earth's magnetic resonance vibrates at the same frequency as our heart rhythms. There's more pathways. 95% of the pathways between the heart and the brain are from the heart to the brain. The heart sending information to the brain. That's me doing Qigong. That's what I do. I've been studying for 25 years, actually longer, 26 years ago. This month is when I began. Um, and that's what I see of me when I'm doing this. When you're doing chemistry, when I'm teaching chemistry, it's these butterflies surrounded by beauty, the transformation. It is transformative. And that is my goal for us this term. That when you think, what is chemistry? It's not just merely, oh, it's math. Oh, it's so tedious and hard. And yeah, it's going to feel like that sometimes. And that's my doggie telling me I'm done. And see y'all soon. Bye.